Victor, we've talked to you before on this programme, haven't you? Uh, and it's always fascinating to hear what you have to say. Although, even though I feel that we've talked to you and know you, I didn't know so much of what you've now put down in this book about what you went through in Dresden. You were a prisoner of war there, weren't you? Um, and suddenly, the skies opened and hell was unleashed. Talk us through what happened. Well, I'll talk you through what happened, but it's just as well to remember that if they hadn't have come over, uh, this morning I would, that time ago, I'd have been marched out into a courtyard, strapped to a ring in the wall and shot. You were, on you were kind of effectively on death yeah, row for trying to escape. Yeah, I was due to, to be shot and... that morning. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, having got that over, uh, what was it like? Well, uh, Harry and myself, when we... Harry was always an optimist and he's always taking the mickey and laughing. And he always said, me, you know, like, something could turn up. Uh, and uh, I don't feel... I don't really remember myself being dispirited. And there were... We was in amongst hundreds of these uh, itinerant people who were all due for the chop. Uh, and then uh, it was about 10 o'clock in the evening when the mosquitoes come over and drop their flares. And we could see that through the cupola in... the glass cupola in the, in the roof. So we immediately knew that we was in trouble. Uh, uh, it was bedlam. It was bedlam. Uh, people, because uh, some some of these incendiaries broke through the cupola, uh, all the glass come down. Anybody who was underneath that, they were pierced and caught alight with this stuff. And so the, the bombs had phosphorus in. Yeah, didn't yeah. They? Well, whatever it was. Yeah. Uh, whatever it was, it caught everything alight, and mm. the place is full of smoke. Because at that point the building was practically undamaged, mm. uh, and it was at, towards the end of the raid of, after about uh, after about forty minutes when the blockbuster landed outside and destroyed the building, what we was in. So I, I recovered consciousness mm. after it must have been a very very short time, and uh, then I got all the dirt out of my eyes, and because I was quite still quite strong and able, and. I went over and Harry, of course, was dead. He, he was sitting against the wall where I left him. Uh, and uh, he'd taken a full force of the... Uh, and as I, as I got out of the building, with, uh, I think there was only about 20 or 30 people left uh, out of a couple of hundred. Mm. Uh, so uh, the building collapsed. And like everything else, we came out of that and we were surrounded by fire. Mm. But... Uh, it wasn't really... At that point in the raid, at, at the first wave, it was just like an ordinary bomb, bombing raid, if you... I don't know, bombing raid, it was a bit worse than that, but, but it wasn't... Uh, it, it, it didn't reach the proportions that it read after the, after the second raid. First of all, of course, you was partially still concussed. I bet, yeah. I mean, you don't get 4,000 bomb burst about 50 yards away from you and, and, it had and no all of a sudden you jump up no. and do a dance. Everything's blurred. So you're staying where you are, but talk us through what happened over the next couple of days and those, those waves that you were talking about. Wave and how, after and, wave. Well, the second wave, by the time the second wave came over, a lot of the people who had survived the first raid were crawling out of their holes in the ground mm. and they were on the service. Or, you know, in, you couldn't do much because there was everything, the fire was growing all the time. And you still got bits of building coming collapsing, uh, uh, and then when the second wave come over, of course these people are trapped out in the open, uh, uh, and the second wave, of course, the bombs were much bigger. Mm. Uh, if if you have a, a stick of incendiaries, say about four inches wide and about two or three foot long, dropping in like clusters of hundred. Uh, and then compare that with a four thousand pound bomb full of nap arm, which when it hits anything within about two or three hundred yards gets incinerated. Mm. Uh, uh, and who are they incinerating? This is the thing. 
It, there's not a uniform in sight. As a historian, do you, have you got to the bottom of what the theory behind Dresden was? Was there a sort of a... a... Well, it was seen as a, a vital... It was seen as a corridor through which German reinforcements were heading to the, the, the Eastern Front against the Soviets. It was seen as a sort of military target. It was also seen that... Churchill wanted to demonstrate the might of mm. the RAF. So when the Soviets advanced, they would see that the, the British and Americans were not to be messed with. So it was all, it was all about the, the, the people on the ground at Dresden were caught between mm. the military necessity of the Allies, but also some of the big sort of strategic mm. power plays going on. Um, but what it meant was they completely destroyed it with Victor last year. And, we, and we, it is one of the most beautiful cities mm. of Europe. Unless you, unless you were actually there, you, mm. you can't possibly... If I tell you, you, you your brain won't accept it. Mm. I mean... And it's affected you. You never, you never saw... There was no sign of any children mm. because the children melt. They, oh. Their bones were too tender oh. and they just melted. Uh, and if you got in... And nearer you got to the centre of the sea, then, then, then you started... You didn't see... You didn't even see skeletons. It was all a sort of a, a jelly mm. uh, with odd bits floating about. Not floating because... And this has stayed with you, hasn't it? You can't talk about it, it because... This, this has stayed with you throughout the whole of your life, Well, it? yeah. Yeah, you don't witness uh, women and children flying through the air alight, mm -hmm. being dragged into these vortex because of the power of the wind. Mm -hmm. yeah, as the fire got fiercer and fiercer, so the wind... Uh, there was more air needed to feed that fire, so it's rushing in as much as... As soon as it's been burnt up there from the ground, it's rushing in and it's making this huge sort of black pillar, mm. which must... I, I don't know. The total uh, it, was, it was like an enormous tree trunk and a hundred times bigger. Dan, when you read the book, when you hear what mm. Victor has to say, the total annihilation, it seemed, that they were trying to achieve of Dresden certainly feels like there was an ulterior motive here that wasn't just tactical. It wasn't just about advancing the cause, but actually there was something a bit more um, uh, underhand about it and sort of the suggestion that, that it could be seen as a war crime. Yeah, I mean, I think that what... Oh, what I feel it was a war crime. You do, yeah, and you, uh, Victor was there on the ground. And I've taken a lot of stick over it. Mm. What are your thoughts, Dan? Well, I think what the, 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 the Western Allies were desperately hoping time and again that they could win this war by battering the German civilian morale, that somehow they'd rise up against Hitler. And ideally, Victor, you'd like this to be put into schools, wouldn't yeah. you, for school children and, and students to, to know. understand it's a little not bit more? Me, is it? it's not no, but that's what you would like, though. You think that they um, should be talked about more? Would you not? I mean, you've got to remember, that book there is confined to what I experienced and what, in my very small perimeter, uh, and that's why it's so small. Because um, you can talk about you can talk about a bomb dropping or people catching a light. You can only mention it once. Mm -hmm. That takes a paragraph. Uh, and uh, if, if it was a if it was a book about Dresden, then Dan would produce a book with about three hundred pages. <laughs> well, well it, it's no less powerful, Victor, for its size. Uh, it's incredibly I moving, I and I think, I, I think I write as I remember. I'm not a so writer. I'm not a writer. I'm not an author. He's a star. Every time yeah. I go on TV with Victor, it's always the number. You know, it's yeah. always the thing that but trends. I, I, it's always I, I can only amazing. write about what I remember as it falls out of. What I don't have to invent. No, villains. undoubtedly, it's every, incredibly vivid. Every, though. every word that I write, it's happened. Yeah, and. To see people, you've got to imagine yourself sitting in a, in a, in a cellar, you can't get out, no. and it's getting hotter and hotter, and then you, and, and if you're still conscious, you're seeing everybody, their skin cracking yeah. open. Oh. Can I go on, or everybody's going to fight? Well, well, Victor, well it's, 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 it's all early, there so in the book, the book, and I think people, you know, need to hear your story, because you lived it, and it's a yes, great it pleasure to have you thing here to again. Think that as I get older, and I... I, 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 I as, as the curtain comes down, that, that at least I've done some good uh, towards uh, alleviating the horror that, that war between nations brings. Yeah. But uh, I'm a bit of a realist. I, yeah, they're, they're, they're still doing it. They're still mm. doing it.